five. This lecture you should only watch once you've done exercise sheet three, which is about analyzing a stream cipher. Now, on the exercise sheet, um, you won't know what the stream cipher is. I've only given you the definition of the stream cipher, but this is actually historically relevant, or maybe unfortunately still practically relevant stream cipher, namely it's RC4 due to Ron Revest. So the cipher has been in use since the late 1980s, and you can see from the description on the exercise sheet also on the slide that it's a very simple description. It fits on just a few lines and it's very efficient to implement in software. It operates on bytes, so that means six, uh, eight bits. And each time, well, whatever is happening is operating on a state vector. So there's a vector S which has each of the numbers between 0 and 55 exactly once. Now these numbers are ex actually exactly the numbers you can represent with eight bits. So it's zero till 2 to the 7 plus 2 to the 6 plus 2 to the 9 plus 2 to the 0. So that's 255. There's also a key, what a surprise since it's a cipher. Um, the minimum length is 5 bytes. So that means, well, 5 times 8 is 40. So that if you would be doing a brute force attack without knowing anything about the cipher, you would be needing 2 to the 40 operations. Now, that is a rather small number for today, and even when it was um, designed, it was a small number. However, late 80s, early 90s were the times of the crypto wars, so there were export restrictions in the United States and also in Europe, which meant that there were limits on how strong the cryptography could be that could be used in products. And so 2 to the 40 was the export strength. So it's something where all the three and four letter agencies were pretty sure that they could break it, Maybe not casually at that point, nowadays it would break it casually, you can break this on your laptop. The system would be able to handle 256 byte keys, but that's totally overkill, also it doesn't match the strength of the cipher. And so the normal usage would be to use 16 bytes for the key. So um, whenever you see an L, think of a number to between 5 and 256. So that is the length of the key in bytes. And so the this, this state vector starts with the identity permutation. So the um, first position as 0 contains 0, as 1 contains 1, till as 255 containing 255. And then when the key is fed in, there's this loop there where you'll see that you will be swapping two states. Now swapping means that you're keeping a permutation. So you're just picking up a number here and a number there, and you're swapping those two. And then you're picking up two other numbers a total of 256 bytes. After the key has been fed in, so in the second part where it says generate n bytes of output stream, there is no more use of the key. So at that point we're just running through as many steps as the user has asked for and then do still some similar steps as above. So each um, output step goes along with a swap step. So the state continuously gets updated. Each iteration there is some computation which picks up some indices where the indices for i are consecutive, so it always goes one after the other, so each position gets handled at least once for each 256 steps. So we're picking this one and we're finding the other one we want to swap this, then we swap. We go over to the next one, we're finding a different position. So the j jumps along pretty randomly, you're going to see an example in a moment. And then we grab a position at this s of s i plus s j, and that is being output. Now let's see how the um, key schedule is working on this key setup. So we're starting with the state up there, where it's didn't write down all 256 numbers because I want to have some more space on the slide. And I'm going to use a key of 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. So that would be export strength, just five bytes. And I'm not even going to run till the last byte, but anyway, here we go. So the first three updates, so we started with i is 0, j is 0. And then um, at that point, we're moving over to um, j, which is looking up, well, the old j, which is 0. And we're putting in s of i. Now i is also 0, so the first s of i is 0 plus 0. And then we're taking the key, well, this 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 vector that I have there, and we're looking at that position i. 
i is 0, so we're getting the first position, which is 10. Since the other two elements are 0, the addition 1 to 256 doesn't change anything, so I, uh, j is now 10. Note that, well, i runs till 255, but the key length might be shorter, so we're taking the i, the position there, more to the length of the key, so the key gets reduced round robin. Okay, and then the last instruction tells us to swap the positions, so the contents of si, which was a zeros position, with the sj, where j is now 10. Well, at this moment, the 10th position contains 10, so we're swapping um, 0 with 10, and so you see here in red the output of it. And then we move on, i gets updated to 1, j gets updated to, well, we had in there um, 10 already, now we're looking up s of 1, so that's 1 still. For the first round, it's just like every new i we encounter until we hit this first one with a 0, where we have already had an update for the, for the first two steps. It's just going to be s i equals i, so we're having j is 10 plus 1 plus the next position of the key. So 11 plus 20 is 31, and so we're swapping the 1 position with the 31 position, and so you're seeing in blue the update that happens. And now j is 31, i is, okay, so i gets to 2, j is 31 plus s of 2, so that's 33, plus the third place of the key, so that is 30, so that gets us the 30, uh, 63 there. Now 63 is the off the slide, so you don't see the matching one, but at every moment, two of these positions get swapped. And we're running through this 256 times, so after the first five rounds, I'm having 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, I'm going back to 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, etc. So if I'm doing this at the very end after feeding in the key after all 256 steps, this is what's in the state. Now the first three numbers look familiar, so that's the 10, 31, 63 that we just put in there, and also you can trace through what the next one would be, it's 63 was a j plus s of 3, which is then 3, so 66, plus the next piece in the key is 40, so that's where the 106 comes from. But then the next, after 106, would be, well, 106 plus 4 is 110, plus uh, 50 is 150, 160, but that's a 237. So that position had been moved one more time. So at some point, the 5 was hit, and at that point, things got moved around. And so, well, pretty high probability that the first one is always the first byte of the key, but it need not be, and eventually things get mangled and mixed in. And then when you're generating the output, here's the part of the output stream. Um, there's a similar loop where at every step i increases by 1, now it runs as, as many steps as you want output. And then the j, while well, there is no key coming in more, anymore, but j gets added to s of i, to update j. Note that all these positions are taken one to 256, so they are valid indices. And then we're swapping, so we're updating our state vector, and the bit, the byte we are outputting is the position, so we're taking the, the two things, we just swap the numbers and those, add them, take that one to 256, well, and take that as a lookup index. So no, this does not change what is the value in there, we're not changing from our permutation to something else. It is just an index we're looking up. So for instance, in this case, here are the first uh, few bytes of output. And then when you have this output stream, you have just as a normal stream side, when you have your message bytes, and you have your plain text bytes, sorry, plain text bytes as a message, and you have a side text bytes, and then it has to be defined how you're doing the computation, but typically you're taking each byte as 8 bits and doing a locate a per position in Excel. You could also define something which is computing more than 256 on those numbers, but it's more common to really do position-wise Excel. So just take this as the bit stream, plain text, bit stream is a key stream, so this output of the RC4 stream cipher, X or position-wise, and then do the output. Okay, so far to tracing through the algorithm of what it's doing, 
But the exercise sheet is actually taking on a journey to explore what the cipher is doing. And that's what, that's what you should be doing with any cipher you're encountering, whether it's something which has a famous name and therefore must be secure, because I mean, how would the internet use something insecure, right? Um, you should just always look whether there's something strange happening. And now with this one in particular, I was guiding you through a few interesting things. So let's plot the second output byte. So just ask your keystream, ask the RC4 generator to produce two output bytes. And I've been doing 10,000 runs just to get a nice statistics here. And you're seeing here the frequency distribution of the output. So this is output 0 till output 255. And then the, the zero is a little bit higher than the others. It's like if I draw a horizontal line there, this is about twice as likely as all the others. Of course, there are some more spikes elsewhere, but the zero is really sticking out. Now, this is a bias which we can actually explain. And so the hint I was giving is that you can look at what happens if the state vector after the end of key setup contains zero. So that means at the beginning of the output generation, so you have put your i equals 0, j equals 0, and this is your state vector. And there's something in the s of 0, some a, s of 1, some b, then a 0, so that's the important part, and then d, and somewhere, so on and so forth. I will need the value at position, at the location of b, so the b which appears in the s of 1 will be important, so well, I just put x there, as a variable, so that I will need in the next steps. All right, so I'm now getting into the for loop where I'm asked to output bytes, and the first step that happens is I'm incrementing i to 1, and I'm updating j to be the old j, well that's just 0, plus s of i, which I've just updated. So I'm taking 0 plus s of 1. Now the s of 1 is this b, as I said, I will need this in a moment, so I'm taking 0 plus b, and then the update of the state vector says I should swap this s1 that I've just, well, where my point is currently for i, and the s of b, where b was the value in here. It's not always like this simple. So it's not just that you're having a b in there and you're updating b. It is only this case because the initial j was 0. Normally you have some addition there. So. This zero here is important for the um, update. I mean, that's how the, how the site is defined. And that means we're now swapping the b with the x. So here is the state after outputting the first byte. And the one we're outputting is at the sum of the values in those two positions. So that's the byte at s of b plus x, whatever it is. We're looking at the second output byte, so this is the first output byte, we don't care so much. Now the second time, then we're incrementing i to 1, and again, j is the old j plus s oops, uh, of i, point brackets, and so j contains b, and now this s of 2, well, that's the, the input condition, that s of 2 is 0. And so that means in this step, my j doesn't get updated. So j remains b. And then the instruction is saying we're swapping the contents of s of 2, that's where the i is now, and the s of b. Well, okay, we know what's an s of b. Well, that's b, because we just moved it there. So we're now swapping these two, and so the 0 goes to the position of b, and the b comes to the position 2. And we still need to output. So the output is at the position of the sum of s of 2, which is b, plus s of b, oh, that's 0. So we're now asked to output the contents of s of b. Well, s of b is exactly the 0 that we have there. So this looks like guaranteed if we are starting with s of 2 being 0, we're guaranteed to output 0. Almost. So I've been putting in one thing which, well, maybe wasn't quite kosher. So I've been kind of uh, alluding to that the b is not equal to 2. So that my b is over here, whereas an x. 
Now it could have happened that B points, that B is true, so that the second array actually gets swapped for the first array in the I equals one iteration, and then I wouldn't be outputting zero. Okay, so most of the time I'll put zero. There's one single case, namely for B equals two, where it's outputting zero, and where it's not outputting zero. So if I look at the probabilities of this happening, um, so if I have starting state S2 equals zero, and okay, if I assume that the key setup is giving me an equal distributed state vector, then that happens as probability one over 256. LC4 is weirder than that, but it's a good approximation. And then it outputs zero, unless we're in the special case that B is two. Now, we have already put the zero in S2, so for the value of b, well, for the value that's at 1, we have 254, the 55 other values, and there's 1 which is bad. So all other 254 values are good. So with probability 1 over 256 times 254 over 255, we're outputting 0. There might be more. So if we assume that there are no other strong biases, so for any other starting state, we would be outputting some value v equally likely. So there are 255 other output states, each of them happening with 1 over 256 probability, and then we're outputting v in that case with 1 over 256. So that together gives me 255 over 256 squared. And that's a tiny bit extra because, I mean, depending on what is in the value that we're swapping in there, um, then in the case that b is 1, so that b is 2, um, then I have another small chance of getting b. But that's then a 256 to the cube, basically, or 254. All right, so then I will output 0. Um, also, I mean, like for all the other starting states, there's nothing particularly happening. So for all the other 255 starting states, I'm getting the same 255 over 256 squared probability that I have already. And then from the first item, I'm having a higher probability or almost one probability of outputting zero in the case of the special starting state of S of two equals zero. Which means if I sum these two up, that is almost the same as twice its size. There's a tiny difference. I mean, it's 255 over 255, uh, 254 over 255 rather than 255 over 256, so it's small, slightly larger, but it's about twice. So that matches this picture you've seen uh, on the previous pages where the one, where the bias, the second byte was about twice as high as all the others. Well, there's more. So this is a plot if I um, fix the first byte of the key to 23. It's almost uniform, there's maybe a little bit sticking out. Let's look at another example. Let's do 42, because I'm going through my favorite numbers here. So, ah, 42. Go back, 23 was this picture, 42 is this picture. Let's do another one. How about sweet 17? So, okay, so. There might be actually a correlation between, it's probably best to see on the 42 example, how far over these peaks are, this is not quite at 50, and what this first byte of the key is. And another example I was asking you to plot is if you take the third output byte and take the key bytes from 0, 1, 2, and 3, then this is the picture. Now what happened here is I'm fixing the third byte to some number. I actually don't know which number this was. I think it was 100 or something. So the, the fourth key byte, so key of three, the fourth byte there has been fixed. But the peak there at 253 appears no matter what value you fix it to. So if I'm looking at the third output byte, varying the first three key bytes, fixed fourth key byte, then I always get this picture. Okay, so here's a short summary, just some of the biases that we have um, in RC4 and how they could be exploited in practice. 
So knowing that the second alpha byte is twice as likely to be zero than anything else, that means you would be guessing, if you're seeing a bunch of outputs, that the second alpha byte, so ciphertext byte, is probably, well, plaintext byte plus zero. And if you can keep a fixed key and see this a whole bunch of times, you might be able to sample over it. So you might actually be able to get statistics that are reasonable. So then you get close to certainty about it. Um, then the first output byte that was the one where you saw in peaks at 17 or 23 or 42. Um, that is biased towards the first key byte. It is not such a strong bias, but if you have a fixed forwarding of your plain text, so if you always start with the same header, then you know what the first plain text byte is, so you're able to figure out what the first output byte is, and which gives you the first key. Similarly, if it's a fixed formatting, but it's slightly varied, so it's like the timestamp or something, information you know, but that might be varied, anything where you can from the ciphertext conclude on the output stream, you can get the first key byte by statistics. And then this final bias, this is a rather odd one, right? I mean, like, why, first of all, how would anybody come up with summing those things? Well, that's exactly what cryptographers do or crypt analysts do when they're seeing an unknown cipher. They try to poke it in every which way while you're doing biases over each, each output byte, looking for correlations with the keys. And at some point you get into these higher order correlations. Or you start to develop some theories about how these things could be related, similar to how we've been tracing through the different states uh, coming from S of, zero, uh, S of 2 being 0, you can also trace for other things and trace how the key maps, and then you realize, hey, this might be interesting. But what does it mean in practice? I mean, how would you have a situation where key 3 is fixed and the other ones vary so that you're getting this nice peak over there, 253? Now, there is actually a real application, namely web, which is well, it used to be the typical way that your computer connects to um, internet routers. And then the use of RC4 in any of these doesn't really match what we define a stream cipher to be, because a stream cipher is supposed to have an initialization vector somewhere. Or in the context of web, it's called a nonce. But there is no place for it. And so what web has been doing is, instead of having the key as L sacred bytes, They've been reserving the first three bytes for the initialization vector. Now remember, initialization vectors are sent in plain text. And afterwards comes the real key. So that's the, the password that you need to know in order to connect to the router. So with web, you actually have the perfect match for the situation that the first three bytes vary each time you're getting a new initialization vector, and they're sent in plain text, and the fourth byte is fixed and interesting. Of course, you want to have the whole key, not just the first byte of the key. One thing is, whenever you get something for free, that means your uh, brute force uh, attack gets faster. But there are actually further relations, which then also take, if you know the first three key bytes, you can get something about the fourth key byte, fifth key byte, and so on. So recursively recover and index bytes. So these relations, there's one set due to Fuhrer, Manti, and Shamir. And there's a more recent one from 2004, uh, 5 and 6, uh, due to Andreas Klein. And so this way you can recover the next key bytes. And that means that web is broken with rather few samples. So Africa and G, where you can find the URL on the slides, um, is actually fully worked out. So if you've forgotten what password you have on your router, you could use it, well, take the laptop, try to connect to the router, and then you can figure out what password you have. And you should only use this on your own router and not for anything else. Okay, so this means there's at least one practical use of RC4, namely in web. But, well, when you look at the graphs of the biases, this is now taken from a, uh, from a talk from 2013 by Dan Bernstein, and he's been graphing the output biases. So we know already that the second byte is biased towards zero, but this is now the first byte. So z sub i, he's using as a notation for the i output byte. And so here you see there's an anti-bias 
somewhere in the time of 28, and there is an anti bias towards zero in the first byte, while if the second output byte is zero, then it's probably not the first output byte. Just by the way, how the swaps are working. This is the bias we know already. There's a spike at zero, there's an anti spike at one, and a few more spikes and anti spikes, which are smaller. So this is now doing probabilities. So um, it's, it's everybody having multiple probability one would be everything is as likely. So it's a 256 times the probability. You would be expecting one over 256. So this is normalized to would be one if it's a good cipher. And you see that it's not quite one practically. It's not a horizontal line there. But maybe the next bytes are better. Okay, well, this looks a lot closer to horizontal line than one. So there are a few bytes. Maybe a bit. Oh, okay. Hey. Well, I think I know how this is going. So if you're advancing, then there's going to be. This. Oh, okay. I was just having a theory that it would be, well, there's a spike early, then there's a spike a little bit further, and then these ones are coming up. Now I've reached 16, and then a weird one happens over here. Well, it's gone again after 17. So smooth sailing. And yes, this picture is, is kind of getting out. There's also a small one. It's like a little garden wall moving towards the bigger spike. See that? So it's now coming towards it as a big one moves. And up now it's past it. Smooth. 31. And at 6, 32, which is another model of 16, we again having a weird spike. So let's look a little bit further. I'm not going to run through uh, all output bytes. There are actually more pictures in the slides that I'm linking to. And you see sometimes the garden walk is well, inverted. And there goes the spike getting smaller. There's another big spike at 48, which is another model of 16. And it, it might feel like it's getting less bad because the big spike, not the the multiple of 16 ones, but the other big spike is getting smaller. But even if you're going all the way out to 256, then there is still an anti spike. So people were always saying, oh, after the 256 output bytes, so starting at zero, then there's actually um, almost horizontal. But no, there's actually a little bit less than one there. And the line is not perfectly horizontal. So what they showed in 2013 is that there is a possibility to recover many plain texts if you have to do 24 cipher texts, and it's basically 100% if you're having 230 plain texts. So that's from the paper that the slides belong to, and this didn't really matter. So in 2013, RC4 was the preferred symmetric cipher. So well, at least in TLS 1.1, at 1.0 and 1.1. These did not offer too many possibilities, so it's basically two evils in there. Um, AES with CBC, which we're going to see next uh, next Thursday, and RC4. And there had been some attacks on the CBC mode for this other one, and so people were saying, well, let's use RC4 because it's not quite as bad. And Reves was also saying, discard some output bytes. Um, but if you're looking at this, and there's already out, uh, discarding 256 output bytes, there's still a lot of out, uh, bias. So is it enough to just avoid some bytes, and which ones should you avoid? Like how many should you discard? Now, there are better stream ciphers. So 2005 was the start of the Eastern competition, which was organized by the European project Ecrypt, and that has led to a whole bunch of um, better stream ciphers. And one of the outputs of that one is Salvo 20 and Chacha 20, and Chacha 20 in particular gets used in TLS 1.2 and 1.3. So if you're using current TLS, then you might be encountering this cipher, or you might be encountering AES with a better mode. Again, we're going to look into what this modes, the CBC or GCM, which you hopefully will be seeing um, next week. So there are better alternatives. But unfortunately, RC4 has been used for a long time. So late 80s till well, 2013 till 2015, there was a strong effort to get rid of it. And so by now it is used less, but you still find it in all kinds of at least legacy applications. And it's really hard to get rid of.
Also as a warning, stream cycles only protect the confidentiality, so Eve cannot read what is being sent, but they do not help at all to achieve integrity and authenticity. Actually, we understand very well what is happening, so we have an XOR of the plain text with the stream cipher output, and we're just getting XORs of those. So if Eve flips a bit over here, well, the key doesn't get changed, so she's effectively flipping a bit in the plain text. So when Bob then decrypts the cipher text, he will get exactly this bit flipped. And so if Eve knows that this is, say, a format about a bank transfer, and she knows that that's the position for 10,000, um, probably Alice will not do a big bank transfer, so flipping this bit will make the bank transfer a lot bigger than Alice had intended. So we do always need to add something to a stream cipher to achieve authenticity. And that is actually the topic for Monday. So with that, I'll leave you here and we'll get back to it. Thank you.